Uh, Guido, what is about uh, the video? Yeah. Let's look at the video first. I, I, I see it the first time, huh? when uh, a university wants to make uh, advertising. <laughs> um, okay, this has been showing you a little bit uh, how it uh, works, uh, what the results are. Uh, 2004, uh, I uh, started uh, a venture which uh, was called Y with a question mark. And uh, this venture uh, had uh, the purpose to try to reinvent something about coffee. The first purpose that I put myself was uh, uh, try to find a way to produce a very good coffee for home appliances, eliminating the capsule. So uh, in the moment uh, <clears throat> in which you look at the market uh, in home appliances uh, and you see uh, Nespresso having some 27, 28% of market share in many countries, and you say to yourself, uh, why do we have to produce a coffee in which uh, the weight, in which uh, the cost, and in which uh, also the ecological cost uh, of the uh, capsule, of the container, is about 50% uh, of the cost of the whole product. So let's say we take a few cents uh, about four, five cents of coffee, and we put them together with four, five, six, seven, sometimes eight cents of packaging. 
which is on one side expensive and on the other side is also uh, very, very strongly uh, demanding for what uh, our uh, environment is. So the idea was how can I do that uh, uh, given the fact that the capsule is born to do only two very simple things. Keep control over the uh, extraction, meaning that the coffee has to be in the right quantity and in the right uh, uh, grinding in order to have a uh, perfect extraction. And the other thing that a capsule has to do is keep the coffee fresh. So this is possible also with other systems. We are still working on that. We are almost uh, 10 years on that. Uh, the next uh, uh, project that we are uh, starting exactly in this month uh, with uh, La Marzocco goes into this direction. How can we try to do this? Uh, it's incredibly complicated. I've been uh, planning and uh, I would say burning at least two universities, Trieste and Zurich, ETH, and uh, not getting results. And the first results that we had, <coughs> and uh, best results, uh, also in a way of uh, cooperation that is still continuing after almost 10 years, is the uh, Università di Studi di Firenze with uh, uh, more, uh, principally this uh, person, uh, Alessandro Parenti, Professor Parenti, which uh, cannot be here today because he has uh, something with the university to do. But uh, <coughs> he's the guy that has been working together on this uh, very long time. And uh, I remember that when we were going around uh, uh, the whole uh, concept uh, of, of, of trying to put together the pieces in order to reach the target that I've been uh, telling you before, one of the things that I was saying is uh, uh, everybody asks you, why does Nespresso make such a good foam? Well, in fact, Nespresso is working with very, very little quantities of coffee. We're talking about max 5.6 grams, sometimes 5.2 grams, so much, much less as we are used to, to, to use on one side. And on the other side, uh, we're talking about a coffee that makes a very, very big, big and long-lasting foam. And I was saying to him, listen, I, I have the impression that what happens is that uh, I think all of you knows how Nespresso works. Uh, when uh, the water goes into the coffee, the first thing that does this water is to push the pressure into the whole system higher, meaning that uh, when the pressure goes higher, water, but also the gases that are contained in the capsule, don't forget that when you take a capsule, about two-thirds, and I think in an espresso capsule, even more than two-thirds of the volume is gas. It's not the wood of the coffee or the contents of the coffee. In the moment in which you increase the pressure, the first thing that happens is that these gases enter into the cells of the coffee. Imagine the cell like a, like, like a, a, a cave, and the pressure goes up, passing through the pores, and in the moment in which the pressure is so high that it breaks the aluminum under the points of the Nespresso system, in this moment, this pressure goes out again. And so I was saying to myself, this is like uh, taking what we used to make here, which is an, mostly an emulsion, logically, uh, espresso is an emulsion, an extraction, and a solution. But the emulsion is the part uh, that makes our, the crema, and that is uh, the strongest uh, container of the aromas. Because given the fact that we have all these small bubbles, the bubbles are filled with gases and with aromas. If we would have a, a flat surface, we would have much less aromas because the aroma would be go, go, going very fast uh, out of it. So in the moment in which uh, we are <coughs> uh, breaking this, uh, we are having a double emulsion position because one position of the emulsion happens on the level of the aluminum that is broken. But you have still a, an emulsion in all the cell pores uh, because uh, the pressure that we've been putting into the cell is going to push the water out of the cell. And when I explained that uh, to Parenti, uh, Parenti, the professor from, uh, he said, why don't we try to do something in which we just uh, do only this? So we push gas inside and then we add the water. And when we add the water, we use the gas in order to push the water out. And uh, we made, uh, was maybe 2005, the first uh, trials uh, at the uh, University 
um, uh, lab using a big bottle of uh, uh, nitrogen at the time because we made tests with nitrogen, we made tests with uh, uh, CO2. And then uh, I said, uh, uh, well, okay, if nitrogen works so well, uh, our air is mostly nitrogen, why don't we use air that we just can compress instead of being obliged to buy a, a full bottle? And then we made a test also with air, and, and now here we are actually working with air with the compressor. And uh, we made those tests, and we've seen that when we bring the pressure of the chamber, it means the chamber must be closed, must be sealed, as you will see, or you have already seen. Um, when we bring the pressure up to 15 bars, we already push a lot of gas into the, uh, um, into the, uh, Mole uh, the um, cells of the, of the coffee. Then we add the water, and the water, uh, given the fact that it's uh, heavier than, uh, than the air, is going to fall automatically on the, on the coffee and is going to wet the coffee. And then we have a waiting time, and after this waiting time, when we open up, we have these uh, 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 20 bars, uh, because uh, the water brings the, the uh, pressure up to 20 bars, that are pushing the water through, and so you're getting this uh, uh, incredible emulsion that uh, uh, I think many of you have already seen. Um, this is uh, a system that makes a completely different coffee. So another problem that I had, uh, I sell coffee in Switzerland because I am the importer of the Ely products in the Swiss market. And uh, I see many made in other countries. We're talking from Switzerland, you go to Austria, you go to Germany, you go to all the north, uh, uh, talking about Denmark, Holland, and, uh, and all the Scandinavian countries. They have the tendency to come from a brewing system which is called mostly filter. And so, <laughs> These people used to drink filter coffee, which is a very long coffee, a very light coffee. Very often have the tendency to say, well, espresso is to be too strong, is too concentrated. Uh, some say they get uh, a heart uh, uh, beating of this. Uh, for me, it's ridiculous because the content of caffeine of a espresso is uh, by far lower than the content of a, uh, of a uh, <coughs> filter coffee but uh, they use uh, to, cho to choose something which is lighter. And so they go to Café Crème, which is the horrible Swiss invention. Um, yeah, I, 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 I've been fighting from 1971, 79, against Café Crème is my biggest uh, enemy. Café Crème and fully automatic machines. These are my enemies uh, for about... Uh, uh, <laughs> And so this is, this is my fight in the, in the, in the Swiss country. And, uh, and uh, uh, what happens with Café Crème? Café Crème is a perfect, uh, I would say, uh, bestemia in Italian. Because if you make, a, uh, if you make an espresso, the uh, perfect uh, uh, definition of espresso is uh, you come uh, with a lower temperature, which is let's say between 92 and 96, you come with a higher pressure, and you extract in about 30 to 35 seconds. A quantity of water that is very, very small. We're talking about 15 for me, somebody 40 milliliters, but not more. Now you want to use uh, the same system in order to make 150 milliliter in uh, at, at the same time. So what happens? You certainly are going to over extract. You are certainly going to have a, a lots of wood into this coffee. You're certainly going to have a coffee that has a wonderful astringency and a wooden taste, and that is absolutely awful. So if you want to ruin a very good coffee, make a cafe creme, no? <laughs> so <laughs> still there is the demand from these people of some coffee that is a little bit uh, uh, kind of lighter, let's say. And this system is very interesting because uh, at the beginning uh, you get out of it a huge amount of foam, of uh, crema as they call it. Uh, I think this is a, a Swiss concept also, the crema idea. And uh, um, this amount of, of crema slowly begins uh, to separate uh, and uh, produces obviously also a, a, part, a portion that is uh, liquid. 
at the end you have a longer coffee. And we are trying to make some tests now to make it even longer. So in order to say, we are not drinking anymore a ristretto that is about 15 to 20, 25 uh, cubic centimeters, you are beginning to drink a coffee that is going to be on the 50s, on the 70s. It's very, very, very light. It's very unastringent. It's very uh, uh, unbitter. Uh, un uh, uh, it's very, very round and sweet. And what is interesting is that uh, the structure of the uh, uh, bubbles that we get out of, uh, of this uh, uh, crema uh, is so thin that it's giving you a sense of uh, having added uh, something really fat to it. So you have uh, the feeling of fatness in the mouth, uh, even if there is no fatness at all. And this feeling is given by the fact that the bubbles are so, so small that they enter into your, uh, into the, uh, the, if we have the uh, uh, taste buds that are like towers, uh, uh, this enters down uh, during, uh, between the taste buds and stays in a certain situation touching everywhere and at the same time uh, uh, giving you a lot of long, long after aroma. Because this is a little bit, uh, maybe many people do not understand the very concept of body. So uh, body, we, we call body something that has a, the perception of body. And uh, this is given by the fact that uh, at the same time we say something is watery, uh, tastes like water, because uh, it's a very uh, simple uh, 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 touch feeling that we have. Water has a very, very high, uh, 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 how do you call it, uh, tension of surface, surface tension. This means that when you put water in the mouth, if these are your taste buds, the water is making bridges between taste bud and taste bud. And then you are going to have only this perception. And this is a watery perception. When you take something that has a very big fluidity and very low surface tension, this is going to penetrate between the taste buds. And so the first thing that happens is the feeling of fat, the feeling of body, which is given by the fact that instead of having a contact of touch only on the upper part of the taste buds, we have it all around, all the taste nerves, the, the, the touch nerves are going to get into, in touch with this. And this is the first information that we have. And then we have the tendency to say something that has body has also taste. Why? Because if I have a, something a liquid that touches only my taste buds on, the, on this level, this is going to be washed out very quickly by my, by my saliva. You call it saliva? Yeah, saliva, yeah. And if you have something that has been entering so slow, so deep inside, and this is also foamy, let's say it's composed of a lot of uh, small, small uh, bubbles that contains all the aromas, these aromas are going to continue to come out very, very slowly, and this is the reason why a perfect coffee can stay in your mouth, and I say always caressing your, your brain with an aromatherapy, for at up to two and a half hours. That is the reason why. So with this system, we have the possibility to have a very, very strong penetration of this parts of the taste buds inner spaces, and we have, an, uh, first of all, this feeling of like we have been adding very, very fat cream on it. And at the same time, we have a very, very long lasting uh, aftertaste. Uh, and uh, this, I think, is very interesting. Well, another thing that is interesting into this system that we have uh, realized, but I have uh, the chamber. feeling that we don't have Because the, the chamber is a 200 milliliter, so it's a pretty big chamber containing the whole uh, uh, air <clears throat> that we're going to push inside. And this chamber can have different temperatures. And we've seen that the lower we keep those temperatures, let's say around 60, 65 degrees, the more this sense of, uh, of uh, uh, cream we have, and maybe a little bit more acid aromas, etc. And the more we increase the temperature, now we are about, what, 75? Yeah, yeah at 75, we reduce a little bit this, and we are, in, in my opinion, we are more near to a classic uh, uh, espresso in the, 
in, in the uh, spectrum of the aromas. Uh, and this is interesting because this is also another point on which the barista will be able to say, I set my machine in this way, this is the way I prepare it. And so you will have maybe one day uh, a few different people making Firenze coffee, which are going to be very, very different one from the other, given the fact that everybody is going to organize his machine in a different way. have a sharp fall of pressure of the pressure of the air pressure we've been making we've been making many many tests uh, we've been making tests uh, also with uh, uh, continuum to keep the pressure yeah. up uh, through the use of a pump oh, wow. at the end uh, from uh, the uh, uh, test that we made in the university we came to the point that the ideal is to have a 200 milliliter um, <clears throat> chamber and to use uh, a big volume of air in order to have uh, a not very strong fell of the, of the curve because we are starting at 20 and I think we end uh, um, by 16, 15. So we don't have such a strong drop of, uh, of pressure. More or less like a lever yeah. machine. And, and then another thing that we need, uh, when we have a bigger amount of air, we are pretty sure that we feel very, very strong all the cells of the coffee. I've been making a test with a machine uh, household uh, using the boiler, which is a small boiler, a very small boiler, and filling just a little bit air. And this gives a result, but it never comes like that. So when you have really big amounts of air to uh, disposal, you, you get the perfect. But in order to have, uh, forgive me, I have so many questions. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, I curious. Questions. I'm curious. <laughs> uh, to, to have 15 bars on the coffee, before the water, I mean, you have a, a switch? A no, we have a compressor. Below, I mean, but you have to, to lock this yeah, pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, this there's is a switch below yeah. the coffee. Yes, below yes. The, coffee. the porta filter itself. The, uh, the, mm. the porta filter, the, the filter holder that we are using now, is a filter holder uh, with a, uh, with a uh, valve inside. With a valve, yes. So you can close it and open mm -hmm. it by hand. So you, you build up. Right. Air pressure on yeah. the coffee, then add the water, then add pressure on top of the water, and then yeah, construction uh, exactly. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, we have another question in the back. Thank you so much. <coughs> Here's the water filter. It's hot. That's why. I'm... Oh. All right. So we got. Right. Oh, okay. That releases the pressure. Awesome. You, uh, one question, what, what is your opinion about the shelf life of roasted coffee? The shelf life of roasted coffee? Coffee has... Yes, how long do you think that roasted coffee should last out of the roaster before it's consumed? Coffee has uh, two big, big, big enemies. The first is humidity and the second is... Uh, oxygen. Um, when you roast, uh, you have an uh, uh, increase of volume of 20% and a decrease in weight of 20%. So you have kind of a uh, popcorn uh, situation. This popcorn situation builds up a huge amount of pressure into the cell and brings to some breakages, which we call pores at the end. Now, this is under such a big pressure that when uh, uh, the coffee is just uh, cooled down without water, so only with the cold air, it stays a little bit closed. But the air we are around, now I would say we are at least 45 to, to 50 percent humidity. Now, the coffee that is coming here out of the roaster is having Something happened. The, the coffee that came, comes out of the roaster is having uh, absolutely zero humidity. Because I always say, remember that at 222 degrees, uh, the last molecule of water has been going at outside under the shape of uh, uh, steam with the light of uh, with the speed light. You know? So this is going to be as something with a huge uh, surface 
because you have all this small breakage, so the surface that is given to the air is enormous, and this is going to catch very, very, very fast the humidity from the air. In the moment in which the uh, cell um, walls begin to have uh, humidity inside, they try to contract, they tend to contract, open the pores, and the 19 bar pressure that you have within the uh, um, cell are going to push out. And in this moment, you are beginning to have uh, the phenomenon of getting the coffee old. This is the first step. As long as the coffee is pushing gases from these 19 bars of pressure that there is into the outside, you don't have any oxygenation phenomenon except for the oxygenation phenomenon that has happened during roasting, because there is oxygenation also during roasting. So what happens is that you are just losing the CO2 within uh, the cell. The problem is that the CO2 is mixed with all the aromas that you have been building, because there is no aroma that you smell that is not on the form of gas. This is something we always forget. Aromas are all gases. They are never liquid, neither solid. So this is the first phenomenon that is bringing you to uh, the first uh, uh, loss of aromas. The second phenomenon that comes in uh, is in the moment in which uh, the coffee is beginning to eat oxygen. Uh, you know that coffee is a very strong antioxidant, and antioxidant, per definition, is an oxygen eater. No? And then you begin into, to get into the moment in which you are beginning to have a, a rancid coffee. I would say that uh, from the roasting moment to the moment in which you have in beans rancid coffee, Mm, five days, but you begin to feel that the coffee is already beginning to be, uh, uh, let's say, tired. I would say uh, comes up to the humidity, the day, etc., the temperature at which you are. But I would say after 12 hours, uh, after 18 hours, you can begin to feel it. I Before it's not drinkable. No. Drinkable. Some people drink it also after one year. <laughs> it depends on your sensitivity. I hate it after 24 hours. 24, 36, that's it. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Uh, do we have any more questions? Here, one second. I taste the coffee. It's very sweet and aromatic. I mean, on the palate. It sticks to the palate for a long time. Have you tried with sugar? This coffee that you brew with machine? Do you can you add sugar? Firenze? Yeah, it's Cafe Firenze. I must coffee. admit, no. No? Okay. It's I didn't best. try, but Did we, I will. I oh, promise. You will? <laughs> okay, because it's very sweet as a coffee. You know, the way yeah, it comes the, out of the, the machine. The taste is sweet, yeah. Yes. yeah. It tends so to. Uh, if, uh, you know, there is a, a, a small uh, uh, concept about uh, bitterness. No? When you make, uh, uh, when you roast coffee, you have Maillard reactions. Maillard reactions are the reaction that are moving the sugar into caramelization. So when you start with the sugar, it begins to be, uh, let's say, blonde. It's still sweet. When it begins to become slowly brown and brown and brown, it begins to be always more bitter. So. We are talking about 222, 224 degrees. Uh, we are having very strong caramelization, and this means that uh, the coffee is uh, pretty bitter. How do we reduce bitterness? Bitterness we can reduce uh, through the structure, and uh, the structure is what we feel as body. What happens is uh, that uh, our taste buds have uh, the sensor for the um, for the um, bitterness, uh, and uh, uh, the sensor is not immediately on surface on the taste bud. You have a, a little hole, and after this hole, there is kind of a cave, and into the cave, there is the sensor. When you have very, very strong body, what happens is that uh, a uh, small uh, uh, bubble is going to close the entrance of the cave, 
And so the signal that is existing into the beverage that you're drinking of bitterness is not able to reach the sensor. And this is the reason why the more one coffee is uh, bodyful, the less it's bitter. The less it's bodyful and the more it's bitter. Excellent, thank you. I think we have another question here. Yeah. Yes, I, how many days should you suggest to, for roasted coffee to wait to use it in espresso? I mean, to leave it, uh, what do we say, reposare, resting? Yeah, it comes up uh, how you uh, package. Uh, we package immediately. So we are talking, we, we're talking roughly within 20 minutes. And uh, we take all the air outside. We go to 760 millimeters of vacuum. And then we uh, put at place of the vacuum, we put nitrogen with 0.2 plus. I've been drinking a uh, tin uh, in 1978, produced in 1964. Was very good. Yeah, because this uh, twelve this, years. We know, but uh, let's say for normal people, <laughs> uh, they used to packaging in a one-way valve and all this kind. But before packaging, or what is what I mean? What I meant it was before using the coffee, for instance. Uh, because when it's too fresh, you know that it, it makes uh, foam, too much foam, and then it's not working. Yeah, I, 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 I don't work with too... Uh, you are not too, normal. Too uh, <laughs> early done coffee. Wait. Yeah, um, so I, I, don't, I don't know. This is something that uh, these people know much better than me, That's because we yeah. were, you use... Pressurized coffee. I know, I know, we know, I know your thing. But uh, I mean, uh, many people are asking me this. They put these questions: uh, how, how long should I let the coffee rest to before packaging or before using? For instance, some don't like the the grinder, the on demand. Because immediately afterward, the, the, the coffee prepared with an uh, air grinder on demand, it makes a lot of bubble, it's uh, inflated, the, the foam. Yeah, so I, 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 I there never must had be this. The reason. Working only with the pressurized coffee, I never had this phenomenon. <laughs> I, I, don't, I cannot answer your question. Sometimes I cannot answer a question, I like it. <laughs> Every once in a great, great while, right? Uh, do we have any more questions from the crowd? Anyone else? Great, that's good. We actually need to get everyone to lunch anyways. Uh, big round of applause for Mr. Illy and his talk. Thank you.